Okay. When you tell, you get fluffy soil for a short period of time, but within a month, that soil is now back to where it was before, and in fact, it's worse off because you've destroyed that structure. Soil. Okay, so uh, the next uh, section in your book, you're talking about um, different gardening techniques and how they affect the soil. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Tilling, mulching, cover crops, raised beds, crop rotation, plant, uh, companion planting. Sure, sure. So uh, it, it's interesting to me that a lot of farmers, people in agriculture, know about no-till gardening or no-till farming. Or what a lot of them do is, is a low-till farming, right? They can't get away from, and do no-tilling, but they, they try to do as little as possible. Mm. And, uh, and it depends on the crops you have, and it depends on the kind of soil you have and a bunch of other things. But this has been around in agriculture for, for many, many years. And it's just now uh, becoming a, a thing with gardeners. I mean, gardeners aren't aware of this, right? So the best way to treat your garden is never till it. Mm -hmm. Whereas historically, people have these little rototillers and they go and they, they rototill their gardens every spring. And the reason they do that is because they want to fluff it up. They know that seeds germinate easier in this fluffy soil. Right? And, and it's true, okay? Um, they also do it to get rid of weeds, right? They go out in the spring, the weeds are starting to sprout, and they rototill it, and the day after, geez, that's all so nice, no weed in sight. Yes. But there, there are several problems with this. As far as weeds go, what you're actually doing is turning the soil, and you're bringing weed seeds that are now buried to the surface so they can sprout. Mm -hmm. So tilling actually gets more weeds than not tilling, okay? But more important to that is that you're destroying soil structure, okay? When you till, you get fluffy soil for a short period of time, but within a month, that soil is now back to where it was before. And in fact, it's worse off because you've destroyed that structure. Soil has a three-dimensional type of structure and it's called aggregation. And uh, I, I recommend every gardener go out into the woods or into a field that hasn't been touched for years and play in the soil. And you'll see how that soil is nice and soft and friable. And in my woods, I can actually dig with my hand. I don't yeah. even need a shovel. Yeah. But when I dig that up, I see these large pieces of soil. These are the aggregates. And that's what we want in soil. We want these three-dimensional structure forming. That's when you've got lots of microbes, you've got plants that have no problem growing roots in it. It's got lots of air in there for the plant roots. Tilling destroys aggregation. So tilling actually makes your soil worse. Okay? Now, one of the things I, I hear about and read all the time by the organic, pro-organic people, they say, well, you know, agriculture is harming the soil because they're taking all these synthetic fertilizers and spreading them on the soil. And that actually isn't true. The problem with modern agriculture is they till. They got big equipment that's running over it to compact things, then they bring tillers along to till it. And that constant tilling does a number of things. It adds air to the soil, which speeds up the decomposition of organic matter. So you lose organic matter. When you lose organic matter, you also lose all the microbes. And then you end up with crappy soil, right? right. So we need to reverse that. And one of the ways you do that is don't till. Don't dig in your garden unless it's necessary. Just leave it, hmm. right? So uh, in my vegetable garden, and, and I'm sure you do this too, you, you do as little in that garden as you can. Yeah. So I go in the spring and I'm planting some pea seeds. That'd be one of the first things I do next spring. I, I will rake the straw over that's sitting there, maybe a couple of weeks before I plant just to let the soil warm up. And then I bring along a rake and I, I make a little furrow, put my seeds in and cover them up. I don't, even, no I don't even do that. I just push them in with my thumb. I jam them in. You know, I mean, I move the stuff aside, like you said, but I don't even make a furrow. I literally drive the same with beans. I drive them into the ground with my thumb. 
Yeah. That's it. No <laughs> so. digging, no digging, <laughs> no, no tilling, no nothing, right? Yeah. We we don't want to touch that soil because we're destroying it. And and by leaving it alone, all that organic matter stays in there and it just gets better and better. And if you do this for a few years, it, you're right. You can just push seeds in. You don't you don't have to do anything. Um I guess I'm just a little neater than you. I like my straight row. <laughs> to be honest, where I put my peas, I probably don't even have to do it anymore. It's just I've been doing it for so many uh, years. That's your ritual. And the, yeah, it's, but the key is stop digging in your soil. Don't yes. walk where you plant, right? Because you're compacting it and don't dig it. Right? I, I often think that we're, I mean, I, I grew up with the tilling model. And I think we almost have a, an addiction to the, the, the feel and the look of tilled soil. Yeah. And so uh, my theory is that uh, you grow potatoes to get that out of your system because you're going to turn your soil over when you, when you dig out your potatoes. Yeah. So that way you can get, you know, you know, at least in one of your beds, you can dig the hell out of the soil once you can get that you know, and you can level it out with your rake and it's all black. And, oh, God, you know, I just love <laughs> so you get to enjoy, you know, just revel in the digging and the, and the tilling and the moving everything around, at least in one bed. Or you know, I grow probably five or six beds worth of potatoes every year, but it's a good way to get it out of your system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, you know, for gardeners, stop that. Leave your beds alone. Right. Yep. Uh, same in your ornamental beds. The same thing. I mean, just just leave stuff. Right. Leave it alone. Don't dig. Um, the only dime I dig in my garden is if I'm moving something and then I do as little of that digging as, as I can. So but the other thing we, we both do a lot of is mulching. Right. So in my yes. vegetable garden, I mulch with straw and in my ornamental beds, I use, try to use wood chips. Yeah. And um, we want to keep that soil covered. Right? We keep it cooler. Um, the um, decomposition of the organic matter slows down a little bit that way. The, the mulch is slowly decomposing and adding nutrients to our soil. Um, we don't have a problem with crusting on the soil. Right? That's another big problem, with, particularly with vegetable gardeners. They, they get crusting and then they come along with their hoe every week and break up the crust. What causes the crusting? I've never had that problem because I cover cover everything. But I remember when I was growing up, I remember seeing it on our garden. So what causes that? Well, the, the crusting is is a combination of things. So first of all, if you do a lot of tilling, you the, the surface gets covered in very small particles instead of these aggregates. So you have very tiny particles. And the crust is actually caused by the pressure of raindrops, mm. which makes no sense at all. But... The raindrops are actually pretty powerful. So they come down and they bang on that soil right. and they, they basically pulverize that surface. And then once the water drains away, it forms that crust. So the crust is really very, very fine particles of soil that's been pounded by rain. Like little bullets, I guess. No, little bullets, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you mulch, you don't, you don't get that, right? It, it doesn't dry out so much. Um, the rain doesn't hit the soil. No. Uh, all those problems go away, right? Yes. So uh, for me, mulching is is really critical. Yes. And uh, you know, I I almost never weed in my vegetable garden. I mean, yeah. the odd weed comes up, but um, usually right beside you know a, a beet or something where the mulch isn't close enough to the beet. But that's right. In my pathways and so on, I I don't weed. I, I just mulch. No, oh, that's right. I only weed if I've been negligent in my mulching. Yeah. <laughs> Which happens that's once right. in a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So huge important. So we also have things like cover crops. So cover crops is something I don't do. Uh, the colder your climate, the harder it is to do cover crops. That's what I find. So I, I'm not com convinced it's worthwhile doing it in my garden. Because by the time I harvest my last things and, and the ground's frozen is six weeks kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, maybe two months. Not much is going to grow there. But I think if the climate's a little warmer and probably if you pick the right things, cover crops will work. So the idea of a cover yeah. crop is that you plant something that grows quick and then you, you either kill it or you let it die off in the wintertime. So a good cover crop is one that you plant in the fall 
it's it's germinates right away when it's still warm so we, we try to do that like in august or something early september then it grows like crazy and then the winter kills it and it's gone for the springtime right? yeah. yeah the other option is to do uh, uh um perennials the problem with perennials is that they're now in your garden next spring so you you kind of have to either dig them up or you have to plant in them or you have to use a herbicide to kill them which to me, it doesn't make any sense. So I, I, you know, I don't see using perennials again in in very warm climates where you've got long seasons. They might make sense. So you you grow something for three four months and then you you grow a cover crop for three or four months, right? That yes. probably works really well. They they work. They add organic matter to the soil. The roots go into the soil, which tends to loosen it. Um, so they're a great idea um, if if you can get them to grow long enough. I've, I've often thought of doing it in a potato bed because sometimes that you can harvest the potatoes in like July or really early August. And I found like anything I want to grow, I have to plant it by like the, the first week of August. Even that might be too late because everything starts to come to a screeching halt sometimes in September. Um, so if I could find like something that grows really, and I also don't want to have to dig it in. So I want something that I know will die in my winter because I don't want to yeah. do any work. And, but it, it would have to be planted like the last week of July or the first week of August and it'd have to grow crazy, crazy fast, you know? I mean, there are things that'll do that, I suppose, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I always thought that you could probably do it like between your rows, maybe plant your seeds before the crops actually harvested. So by that time, the cover crop, you know, by the time you harvest, the cover crop is already several inches tall, yeah. but you haven't yeah. really had any competition yet. Yeah. So I'm sure there's ways of doing it. Yeah, that um, makes sense. I've just been too lazy to, to really do it. <laughs> I was like, I pick my potatoes and I can just throw a bag of leaves on it. Nah, done. You know, it's just all over with. Or, or sometimes I'll even plant uh, a spinach in those beds because I want to eat spinach in uh, in in, in, Octo in October, right? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. 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 Um, raised beds is an interesting topic. Um, I think raised beds are great. In fact, the first garden I ever made was a raised bed. But in those days, we didn't put walls around them. Okay, We didn't go out and buy expensive lumber or bricks or anything else. We just went out and we, we took the, path, the soil in the pathways and dug down six inches and moved that onto where the gardens are. And um, that raised them up a few inches and that was a raised bed, right? And that idea works really well. The other idea in there is the fact that you have a bed that's you know three four feet wide and you never walk in it. You you do all the cultivation and harvesting from the sides, and that's great because now we don't have compaction, right? So the soil yes. is healthier in there. So that makes perfect sense. And I don't have a problem with someone going out and buying two by six and making raised beds a little bit and, and makes it a little neater. What, what I find really strange is these people as they go out and make raised beds that are four feet tall, yes. right? They go out and buy all this lumber, they make them, and then they get online, they go, well, how do I fill this thing? I just got the price of soil. I can't afford it all, right? I need six cubic yards for one uh, four by eight garden or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then, of course, they... They come back and say, well, it, 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 you know, it's, it's sort of easier to dig in there. I don't have to bend over. Now, to be fair, there people with mobility issues, I think those gardens are, are great, right? But uh, one thing I did very informally last year is I, I just kind of tracked how much time I actually spend bent over in one of my beds. So this was a bed where I had carrots and beets and so on. Um, you know, you, you rake a little bit in the spring you pull the straw away you make it a bit especially for carrots because the seeds are a little tricky to germinate so you want a flat bed so you rake a little bit you know but actually you're standing up with the rake so you're not even bent over if you if you mulch you don't weed much right harvesting you have to bend over and seeding you have to bend over but i would say in, in most small beds i i wouldn't spend more than two hours a year Yep, that's that would be my estimate. Two hours and that's a year. spread over six months. Yes, right? you can, you can, and people are saying, "Well, I, I'm I don't want to bend over." Well, you know, if you can't bend over for two hours and six months, then maybe you shouldn't be gardening. <laughs> yeah, you can do ten, 10 minutes a day for one week, and you're half done. You know, sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think people have this vision of 
of uh, spending a lot of time bent over and it it really isn't there in a small backyard garden right it's not like we have a quarter acre and we got long rows that we have to weed and so on and I think the other thing is maybe they've been reading books and information from people who don't know how to garden too well but if you yes. do what we're doing right don't don't till don't uh, mulch well so you eliminate all the weeds and, and so on the amount of time it takes to garden is actually pretty small that's right. So I'm kind of against these these big bads. And um, the, the other reason is that some people then come along and say, well, I'm going to fill it with some really good stuff. So I'll fill it with compost, for instance, or I throw in perlite and vermiculite and then a bunch of other things. Right. Um, you know, all these vegetables grow really well in soil and the soil you have in your garden is probably pretty good, except it doesn't have enough organic matter in there. And why not just use what you have, right? Rather yeah. than making these big bets. So I'm for raised beds because it keeps people off the soil, but I'm not for tall beds. No, I think they should, in some very special cases. I often think they should change the terminology to slightly raised designated gardening spaces. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, but that's, that's all. I, I mean, my beds are six inches high and actually, the, I mean, that's just the wood. The soil, it might just be three inches above grade at the most. Sometimes it's and many of them, even though I've got a two by six, the soil is at grade or just slightly above grade. And most of what that border is doing is keeping my leaves and mulch from blowing all over the damn place in our crazy hurricane winds here. Um, it yeah. just sort of contains it, right? So uh, I've noticed the same thing. Even people I talk to at work, they build these monuments um, and then they got like, you know, a cucumber plant with one cucumber that's the size of my thumb. They don't know what the hell's going on. All the water's going out of their garden. It's can't hold water because all the water's in the ground and they're like, they're three feet above the ground. They filled it with God knows what, you know, filled it with peat moss or something like that. You know, and, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so, so it's raised beds. <laughs> um, crop rotation and companion planting. Two of my favorite topics that I've, I've written quite a bit on in my, my Garden Myths blog, too, about both of those topics. Yes. The, the short answer is neither of them really work. So uh, crop rotation is a concept that works great in agriculture. Large I, scale. I have 50 acres over here and 50 acres over here, and I swap crops once in a while. That works, and uh, it, the science is really solid on that. You know, if I was garden, doing vegetable gardening on an acre site, maybe rotation works a little bit there too. But when we're talking about the normal backyard garden, so I'm going to grow tomatoes here this year, and then I'm going to move them 20 feet over here for next year, that makes no difference whatsoever. Except in, in one case that I've been able to find, and that's if you have uh, nematode problems. Because right. nematodes are very tiny worms are almost microscopic and they can't move very fast right so 20 feet for them may take them five years to get there yeah, yeah. Right? so if you have a nematode root problem a backyard might work for everything else it doesn't work all these flying insects one of the flying insects i i, I looked at when i wrote the article was um, this caterpillar that's found in the northeast u.s and it migrates down where the monarchs go every year. Okay, so but it can't go four feet. Yeah, it leaves here, <laughs> flies to Mexico for the winter, flies all the way back, and you've moved your your crop over by twenty feet, hoping it won't find it. I know, or just a few. I mean, I I, I rotate my crops because it's 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 no harder to do than to not do it. I mean, I'm just I it's in bed here, bed here. I just move everything over one bed, so it's 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 not hard to do. It doesn't really it's no harder to do than to not do it. Um, and there's something about it that seems like it's, it seems logical to me, but it's not, it's not uh, a challenge to do. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, I mean, you're right, especially on a really small scale like that. What about a certain case though? Like, so this year in one of in my kale bed, uh, I had two, I had a four by eight bed of kale and I had two different varieties of kale. Uh, a, a kale that's much like the ones you buy in the grocery store, the curly leafy kale. And another one that's like a Siberian kale, like a red Russian type thing. Almost all the red Russian kale were destroyed by something, almost all of them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you better bet I'm not growing one brassica in that bed next year. I, I don't know if that's well, well advised, but I'm not even going to grow brassicas in the adjacent bed. I'm going to move them out of there for a while. I don't know what the hell happened there. It wasn't, um, I mean, I have the, the white, you know, the small white, you know, that's that, that uh, this, little white butterfly white that has yeah. this camouflage caterpillar. They're everywhere. And, you know, it's prop rotation will not protect you from that. No. They're flying. Right? They can go anywhere. But something rotted the, it just got into the center of that and just destroyed it. And it no. didn't bother the other kale, which is really weird. Um, but I think it would be unwise to grow kale in that bed next year. There's something in the ground. Well, the, I could the, be wrong. The, but the trick with that, though, is to understand what it was that yeah, did the damage. I don't know right? what it was. I just <laughs> so uh, moving it to another bed is only going to work if that organism is spending the winter in that bed. Yes. And then in the spring, when it hatches out, it's not able to get to the other beds. So if it's any kind of flying insect, it's going it to find your kale no matter where you put it. Well, let's see. The, I got another kale that's about 20 feet away. It was far, Again, it's that other species. It's, right? it's, it's the, the, the two species. The one kale, the one that was attacked, is the tastier one. Of course, the thing, whatever it was, got at that, right? Uh, yeah. I don't know what it was. Anyway, yeah, you're, you're right. If it's a flying, I mean, I, I basically took the thing out, dug the roots out, and threw it in the woods as far as I could get it, hoping that whatever babies were in the roots were going to be exposed to the elements and, you know, but. Uh, See, uh, there, anyway. there are some cases where, where uh, companion planting will work. So in this case, for instance, you have two kales and whatever it is goes after one of them. So. In your case, you might plant both varieties again next year to make sure that the pest only goes after one of them. But it's going, after the, one I, it's going hmm. after the one I like. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> you, it doesn't work quite that well, but no. at least you've got, you've got to eat the one, right? Yeah, you know. So there are cases where companion planting does work. Um, the reason I'm against companion planting mostly is that most of the information that's available online. Oh, it's all woo-woo, yeah. It, it doesn't work. Like, no yeah, one's yeah. studied any of those things. Oh, yeah. um, in fact, there was a, a recent book that came out on companion planting. And it's, it's something, uh, the, the subtitle is something like the science of companion planting. So I thought, well, okay, I, I gotta read this book. So I actually got a copy of it to review on my site. Oh, no. And I went and I picked, um, three things in fact the, the way i picked those was that the author had mentioned these three on a talk show oh. as three really good examples of science proven companion planting so i said okay so i'll get those i look at the references they have there are no references there's no scientific study to support those three and the author was unable to provide any okay then i went off online and looked for scientific studies I couldn't find them either. And then for some reason, I did a fourth one. I'm not quite sure why, but I looked at the fourth one too. The, there just is not enough information out there. So I'm sure there are some combinations that are worth doing. And, and I'm slowly looking at some of these. So garlic and, and, and other onions actually do deter pests on some crops. Hmm. So it's actually not a bad idea to put garlic in between other things in the hopes that they will keep some pests away. But common things like marigolds, for instance, uh, don't work for most of the pests that they're recommended. No, I, I, th I used to, I used to grow marigolds with stuff because I, like, I just heard someone say, "Oh, marigolds prevent pests." That's all I'd heard, mm -hmm. and so I planted some marigolds with my kale, and I had great kale. So I said, "Hey, the marigolds," and it's just classic type one error, post hoc ergo propter hoc, you know, just the logical fallacy i did this thing everything works so that thing caused the things working good right. and it's, it's just just a coincidence you know like the it just it just so happened that there was marigolds there and other things growing well if the marigolds had them in there everything would have been fine anyway in that particular case right because once i read about marigolds they don't do anything for i can't remember what the plant was but they don't do anything there's a specific instance where marigolds can, can in a certain order in a certain way 
Yeah, you explained it in your book. Um, so, found yeah, so, so marigolds actually will stop uh, the root nematodes, which are very destructive for things like uh, carrots. But it only works in really hot climates like Florida. Ah, yes. Because you have to grow the marigolds in the same place you're going to grow the carrots. So you first have to do a crop of marigolds. And the nematodes will go into the marigold roots. And then you, you pull those out and then plant your crop before the nematodes come back. Oh, so they don't poison them. They just, they're just in them. They're just in them. So you oh. actually need, but you need to plant two crops, one after the other, which, yes, which only works in hot climates. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and putting the marigolds beside the root crop doesn't work. It actually has to be in the same exact soil that you're going to grow carrots later on in the year. Right. And it has to be the right kind of marigolds. Only some species of marigolds work, which, of course, no, none of these popular websites and so on tell you. Right. Right. Uh, so there are cases where companion planting works, but the majority of things that gardeners read about either don't work or there's no scientific support for.